Welcome to the Verif Voices podcast, a collection of conversations with leaders from across the industry, sharing tips and valuable insight into shaping the future of online identity. This podcast is brought to you by the people of Verif, rebuilding trust in the digital world. Hey there, and welcome to a new episode of Verif Voices. My name is Abe Post Hyatt. I've worked at Verif for four and a half years and originally joined the team as our first US-based account executive. Today, I manage our strategic revenue team uh, and work with some of our most important partners across the board. Today's episode of the show is a little bit different. Um, I'm based here in New York City, um, and my lovely grandmother, Alice, uh, lives out in Short Hills, New Jersey. I was planning to visit her for lunch and to catch up in general, and she mentioned that she would love to know a little bit more about what I do at work and what my brother does at work, who's also a B2B account executive who just started a new role. And it got me thinking that that kind of conversation could be really beneficial to record. I started thinking about generational insights on software, on technology, and of course, on identity verification in general. My grandmother, though she is very, very young in spirit and behavior, has seen the world go through some incredible transformational changes over many years. Compared to some of my other grandparents or the grandparents and my friends, she is very technologically savvy. We're always texting on iMessage. She's constantly sending me uh, Instagram reels with recommendations of things to do. She owns an Apple Watch, an iPad, a MacBook. She FaceTimes. And I think that's really special, both in general, because it allows us to stay in touch more and it allows her to get some, some resources that she needs rather quickly. But it also means that she has a very unique perspective on, on how much identity has changed in the context of the digital world. Withdrawing money from her bank account is a lot different today than it was just 20 or, or 30 years ago, or even when, when my mom and her sister were growing up. And I know that having an in-depth discussion about IDV, about KYC, what it is and why it's important, one, uh, will lead to a greater understanding and appreciation from her side, but two, it might help out a lot of folks around the world. IDV can be daunting. It can be confusing. Verif, obviously, we try to make it as easy and frictionless and accurate as possible, but she is part of a very susceptible generation to scams. There's a lot of elder abuse and support scams out there, and her demographic is at risk constantly. So I had a really great time, as always, seeing my grandmother and catching up with her, and I want to thank her for allowing me to record uh, part of our conversation. And in that conversation, I just kind of let her take the wheel and describe how she sees fraud, how it impacts her life her experiences with identity verification, specifically banking and financial technology, undertaking such massive changes over the past couple of decades and beyond. And it was really great just to be able to simplify and explain exactly what we do, how it can help her and why it's important to the world. And through putting this conversation on the podcast, I'm hoping it will help folks explain to their own families and friends how important this is, why it's something we need to pay attention to, and hopefully lead to a greater understanding of the value in Verif and identity verification in general for all kinds of different people in all kinds of different places around the world. I'm really excited to bring this conversation to you. I hope it's useful. And without further ado, let's bring in my grandmother, Alice Post. You're a very technological person. I am. I would say so. I mean, you send me Instagram reels. I don't know anyone else whose grandparent does that. So <laughs> that's difficult. <laughs> some some might say. Maybe we start with financial services. Do you remember that transition of moving from going to the bank physically to like selling someone? Oh, of course I remember. I still go to the bank physically occasionally, but it's much easier to sell or Venmo somebody. That's much better. Is it also scarier? A little, because they constantly warn you about who you're selling. Make sure you're very sure whom you're sending your money. I believe at the beginning I did make an error. <laughs> I remember that on Venmo, right? <laughs> on Venmo. It wasn't too bad. It was, I think, only $50, but... 
it was a lesson. Um, so I'm more careful now. How how are you more careful? Well, I wanted to try sending, um, I think it was either birthday or holiday checks to my grandchildren, and I wasn't quite sure. So I checked by looking at their phone numbers because there seems like there are many people with the same name. So I was able to check their phone numbers to make sure it was the right person. And it worked. That's good. Yeah, actually, I was talking about this on another podcast recently. Because when you go to the bank, I mean, they probably know you at the local branch. But generally, you'll say, I want to make this change to my account or withdraw Mm -hmm. money. And they will ask you for your license or your ID. And then they'll look at your face and they'll look at the computer and they're confirming okay this is Alice she is who she says she is that's her ID that's her face on the ID that's the same address in the system like things like that yes most of my transactions are with the machine outside (laughs) have you ever been asked not by a person but on like the iPad or your phone or laptop to show your ID or anything like that or upload a picture of your license or No, I don't think so. Although I worry because sometimes I have been asked for my social security number mm. and that worries me. And now that I think about it, I probably should never have given it. It's been said that you should only give it if you have made the call. Yeah. But I have been scammed several times. So I'm a little more careful now. Those are not really support scams, but I guess impersonations, right? Well, they've been different. One, I think the first one was uh, an email that said the person had all my passwords and Uh. If I didn't pay up, they were going to send something awful to all of my contacts. Right. They were threatening to leak private information for a ransom, basically. Either information or made-up information. Damaging information. Yes. I consulted you, and your advice was to ignore it, Yeah, which I did. That's risky advice. I'm glad it worked out. (laughs) Well, I think the rationale was that the scammer would be sending out thousands of such threats and would not be following up on anyone who did not respond. It's happening a lot with um, dating apps now. They kind of impersonate someone, which is why I think dating apps are beefing up security. Now they immediately hold you hostage, so to speak, and Mm -hmm. say... Cool. You're, you know, I'm not who you thought I was. Pay up right now, or the whole world is <laughs> is going to uh, going to See learn them. a lot more about you yeah. than I think you want them to. They could, even if you didn't have damaging images available, they could make damaging. Well, that's a very images. pertinent point. Uh, we were just talking about AI, mm. and yeah, deep fakes. Have you are you familiar with the term? I've heard the term. Yeah, but it's basically mm. creating. Fake images, synthetic images of whatever you want, just using text prompts. So Mm -hmm. you can also do things like swap faces. So change the face on a on a picture Mm -hmm. of someone. Um, You can generate completely new images. Something we see in our system like many times a day. Mm -hmm. And they're getting a lot more advanced. The dangerous world out there. So then, back to the initial topic. The reason I ask about all this is because at Verif. Our goal is to high level build that trust on two sides of of a computer, so to speak, so that you can actually verify that if you're a bank and and someone claims to be someone and you have a very high maybe cost of fraud or you don't want someone coming in and maybe you're going to hire them and um, you want to make sure they are who they say they are, uh, that process has gotten a lot more complicated with remote work with all of these systems mm-hmm. being online, it's not as simple as seeing someone walk through the door and saying, yeah, I know who you are. I've, I've seen you mm-hmm. before and here's your badge. Using a bank as an example, right? There's two sides of it. One is the regulations, the legal side. And then the other side is the 
health of the business and, and protecting consumers. But you know, there are laws now that have existed for a while, but they've evolved quite rapidly because technology has that mandate, for example, that financial institutions say, this is Abe, this is his driver's license. It's a real driver's license. It's his driver's license. It's his identity. And I'm also confirming that he is a real live person, uh, that it's not, you know, a picture of a cardboard cutout that he found mm -hmm. online. You can now make deep fake images of documents. So I could mm -hmm. go on a website and for a very inexpensive price, generate a driver's license that looks like your driver's licenses. So it's getting really scary for businesses and individuals, especially because so much of our data is, is out there already. It's pretty easy to create an identity around it. Financial institutions, for example, are obligated to do that check using a government-issued ID. Um, and then on the other side, one, businesses generally don't like fraud. Um, they want to have an attractive business to consumers. They don't want to bleed money. And of course, it's a, it's a huge time suck and resource waste. And then I only want to put my money in a bank if I know it's secure. And frankly, if they don't check my identity, I'm a little concerned about that. Because then mm -hmm. someone could take over my account and send all my money to themselves. Yeah. So does your company do this only for businesses or for individuals as well? We are typically business to business. Mm -hmm. We would partner with Bank of America and they would buy our software and implement it. Mm -hmm. So we sell from one business to another. Yeah. So a company like a bank uh, who's legally obligated or maybe a ride sharing company who um, may be in some cases legally obligated to check identities, but more of a trust and safety mechanism for the safety of the riders and the drivers and things like that. They will implement it. Uh, as a business, and then the individual riders, drivers, customers, food orderers uh, will be the ones that actually interact with the software and say, hey, this is my ID, this is my face, uh, I am who I say I am, I'd like to use your service. What were you picturing when you thought of an individual being our customer? Uh, I was thinking of one of the other scams that happened to mm -hmm. me where the scammer had all my personal information information they had my social security not my actual yeah, yeah. yes uh, and the only reason i found out about it was because um a harley davidson dealership called me to ask if i was still interested in motorcycle and he... listeners at home maybe we should clarify that you're not much of a uh, motorcycle enthusiast <laughs> this is true <laughs> this is true they had filled out an application which included my social security number and every other bit of personal information about me so that was kind of scary it is scary so i was wondering about the company that's called LifeLock, but I don't know anything about that. I just had to freeze all my credit accounts. I think the individual or individuals had also purchased, well, they opened credit cards in my name and they oh, wow. purchased airline tickets wow. and okay. things like that. So I was, I think, able to eventually straighten it all out. <laughs> but I do now have a freeze on all my credit inquiries. So it sounds like they were both trying to assume your identity, but also access to your credit. So both mm -hmm. the theft of your identity as well as the theft of actual money. Mm -hmm. Was the reason Harley-Davidson dealership um, reached out, it sounded like they reached out not because they suspected fraud, but because they were wondering if you were still interested in buying a Correct. motorcycle. They just wanted to so close is, the deal. Is it your impression that they didn't even know that that you had been a victim of the fraud and then Correct. they were the recipients of that fraud? Correct. When I um I found it laughable when they called me and I <laughs> informed the salesman of my age. <laughs> <laughs> um then then he gave me all the information about the was fraudulent it, application. Was it filled out online, the application? I don't know. I don't know. Interesting. So LifeLock, what they do is really important. It's kind of tangential to what we do, but they're more on the monitoring side. 
So mm-hmm. if your SSN pops up somewhere like an online, like CarMax or something mm-hmm. like that, um, or someone wants to buy a motorcycle or suspicious activity based on things like credit monitoring, lost credit cards, or kind of the restoration of identity when it does happen to you, they're on those sides of it. So they cast a wide net, I, I presume, and and monitor the entire global financial technological ecosystem to flag things and fix them. Whereas we try to prevent them before they actually happen. That's better. Yeah. So let's just say for sake of example, you did decide to get back on the bike after all these years of retirement from the roads. The gang. And yeah. And you said, you know what? I'm really, I know a lot about motorcycles. I know the model I want. It's this Harley Davidson model. I don't even need to go into the store to try it. I'm just going to buy it from them online and pick it up at the dealership, which may be what this um, fraudster was trying to do to you. Mm -hmm. Uh, Where LifeLock would come in is where you probably got, well, Harley Davidson came to you, but in the other situations where your information was leaked, that's where LifeLock comes in. Where we would come in is when that person goes to HarleyDavidson.com, chooses the model they want, and clicks the buy now button, we would say, cool, before you buy this motorcycle, please show me a picture of your driver's license. It would guide you through the process. So we need to see the front first. We need to see the back. We need to see generally both sides, unless it's a passport. And then typically as well, businesses will ask for a selfie, which Mm -hmm. I'm sure you're familiar with, because without the selfie, I could still take your wallet and assume your identity online. Mm -hmm. But with the selfie, we can not only match the face on my head uh, in the picture Mm -hmm. to the face on the document, which we're also validating, but we could also do what's called a liveness detection, which says, okay, not only do the faces match, but this isn't a cardboard cutout. He's not holding up an iPad with an image of Alice Post Mm -hmm. on it. This is actually a real live image of her face taken in the moment, same face as the document. The document is legitimate. The Wi-Fi network or the phone or computer that you're on is not tied to any fraud patterns or displaying a different country. You know, if your computer Mm -hmm. is in, I don't know, Pakistan, but you have a New Jersey ID, sometimes that's totally valid. We need to look at all those data points to make sure that it's not nefarious activity. Does that make it a little more clear? Yes, that does make it more clear. I'm thinking of another scam that I don't think that would work for, but Mm. that's... Well, let's hear it. Let's see. Maybe it would. Well, uh, a friend emailed me and asked if I could help her uh, send an Amazon gift card to somebody. Yep. And I said I would try to help her, and I did, and I sent the card, and then subsequently realized that it was not my friend who had emailed me and that it was a scam. But once you've sent that card, you've sent that card. So they found the name of someone that knew you. And their email. And their it must have been a slightly different email address or something like that or well they i guess they must have into some my friends list of contacts uh, and sent me this email from mm-hmm. her address so it was from her email yeah but it wasn't her i can think of two ways off the bat that we can actually prevent that but it would be more on the the ownership of the businesses right her email provider should have done some kind of check to prevent the person logging into her account. Likely her password got leaked probably Mm -hmm. in a data leak, which happens a lot. And they were able to just go right into the email. A big part of our software is looking at the network and the device, like the Wi-Fi network and the machine that you're on. And in theory, there was probably an anomaly there whoever Mm -hmm. this person was that logged into her email and took over her account probably was not in a place that she's typically in. And we can see that from what's called the the IP address, Mm -hmm. which shows down to pretty specific details, your, your geolocation. 
So unless that person knew that was going to be checked and went to a coffee shop that was mm -hmm. in that zone or was literally in her house or so, they were probably across the country or the world. That's one flag that they could have looked at from Amazon side too. I mean, Amazon is is generally very good about security and building mm -hmm. trust with customers. But I do wonder if there could have been more checks. Is that the only time you've ever emailed an Amazon gift? Yes. So I would think Amazon would, you know, they do you have a prime credit card as well. No. Okay. But they know a lot about you. They probably know your birthday, right? They certainly know everything about you in the context of your activity on Amazon. Mm -hmm. And this is more of a creative idea. It's not something that I'm familiar with companies doing and certainly not mandated. But for example, with Venmo, hey, you've never sent money to this person. Please uh, verify the last four digits. They could say, hey, you've never sent an Amazon gift card before. Do you want to double check the details? Yeah. Now that mm -hmm. might not have actually, you might have said, I, I'm, mm -hmm. I've already succumbed to the email scam, yeah. so I'm still sending it, but yeah. perhaps it gives you pause, yeah. a reason to maybe say, you know what, I'm going to call my friend on the phone mm -hmm. and make sure I that have. that she emailed me. I should have, because I subsequently found out that another friend had gotten the same request, and she, smarter than yeah. I, and she did call and ask, if it was legit. Well, she should have called you and said, you're next. Yeah, I wish. <laughs> Watch out. <laughs> now that I know what your company does, what do you do for the company? Good segue from talking about how businesses implement this stuff. I've worked here at Vera for almost half a decade. When I joined as a account executive, I was the first US-based salesperson, because as you know, we are an Estonian company. We had some some good partners here in the US, but of course our goal was we were doing really well in Europe, so we want to bring the product to the US. So for four years, I was an individual contributor, an account executive, reaching out to businesses like the ones we talked about, ride-sharing companies, banks, really all kinds of companies, social media because they're having fraud problems or they have laws they have to comply with. And so I would help them make sure that the software is a good fit for their business. Generally it is because we have mm -hmm. you know, the best product in the market, but making sure that it fits with the technology, what's called their tech stack, so the technology that their whole product is built around, making sure that we're aligned on, you know, we have a very customizable product. Some businesses say we don't really see a ton of fraud and we have a pretty high risk appetite. So just give us something cheap that gets customers onboarded as quickly as possible. Some other companies say, you know, one case of fraud would be catastrophic and we don't necessarily care how long it takes for you to get someone onboarded. We want to be 100% sure that they're not a fraudster. Mm -hmm. There's an important process to aligning with companies, figuring out what they want to buy, and then helping them buy it and implement it. How do you know which companies to call? Where do you get your contacts from? As any Verif go-to-market employee in our department has heard me say a thousand times, the number one reason a company buys Verif's product is because they are legally obligated to. So that certainly does not make up our entire customer base, but any bank any financial technology company, any payments company like Venmo, which is owned by mm -hmm. PayPal, they are literally legally obligated to buy it from someone. So the question is not, are we going to buy it? The question is, are we going to buy it from Vera for someone mm -hmm. else? So we know good ways of connecting with those companies. We have awesome clients that send us referrals all the time because they see great performance. We've got an awesome board an executive team, and then we also have a team of what's called sales development representatives whose job is to go out via email, LinkedIn, cold calling, things like that, and reaching out to the people in charge of those operations at these companies and telling them, hey, we think our, our technology could help improve your business, save you money, and decrease fraud rates and in turn get you more customers. So we should have a, a chat and see if you want to test it out. 
And that applies to the other side of the market too, which is maybe social media companies or, or sharing economy companies like Airbnb. They want to maintain safety for obvious reasons. If someone's in your home, you know, maybe you want to check that they're not a convicted felon. If someone's <laughs> going to drive you around, you know, you want to know that you're safe in that car. Maybe it's late at night and you fall asleep. You want to know that you're going to get home safely. And so there's what I call the need to have side of the market, which is the ones who are legally obligated, but still really, really interesting and important customers. And then the nice to have, which is nobody's telling us it's illegal if we don't do this, but we would like to do it because it will make our company better. But do most companies already have some yes. form? So you're asking them to switch to your company? Yes. Because you have such a great company. Yes, definitely. And <clears throat> the pace of innovation right now in general is very fast. And that applies to our industry too. And we have a very saturated industry. There's a lot of providers. So generally bigger companies like a bank or you know any kind of multi-billion dollar business will do kind of a market scan on a maybe an annual or somewhat regular basis mm -hmm. to make sure that they're using the best technology mm -hmm. for their needs. Because generally where an ID check will sit is in the onboarding aspect. When you sign up for a bank account, you will have to do it before you're granted the bank account and you can start putting money in and, and using it. And we always want to mitigate as much fraud as possible. But what's really important too is making sure that we don't turn away an honest user because we erroneously think that mm -hmm. they might be a fraudster, but they were actually an honest person that perhaps is unfamiliar with how to do identity verification or, or something like that. And because of where we sit, it usually has a direct impact on the bottom line of the company. Uh, if you start turning away tens of thousands of customers because your rules are too stringent and the lifetime value of a customer is $1,000, you're now in the millions, um, mm -hmm. most likely in terms of losses. Sitting at the basically the pearly gates and being the arbiters of who gets to enter and who does not, you know, if a business starts onboarding a million more businesses quarter over quarter, and they're a public company, their stock price is going to go up. They're going to raise money. They're going to get more customers. And so we really have the ability to make a company stronger and, and healthier. So it's very important that they continuously look for new options, because even if they can improve an important metric, like their rate of onboarding improved users, by 1%, that 1% could be half a million people. What happened in January uh, or after you've oh, been right. doing this for <laughs> four and a half years? Yes. Yeah, so for four years, I was the person helping to, to onboard some uh, amazing, amazing partners and clients that we have, some of the biggest companies in the world. And then in January, as the company has been growing, we formed what's called a strategic revenue team, where we work with mainly billion dollar businesses, public companies, and really large enterprises, which is very complex, but very rewarding. So I was a part of that team. And then we had a position open for someone to actually lead that team. And having the amount of knowledge that I gathered over the past few years and having close relationships with our clients and considering my own personal goals to be in leadership positions down the line, I thought it would be a great idea for me to apply for that position. And I ended up getting the job. So now I am the manager of that strategic revenue team. And so we, we bring on new clients and then we also maintain the relationships and grow the relationships. And we work with our account managers who kind of do the day-to-day -day post sale relationship. We have solutions engineers who are the best in the industry by far, and their job is to help on the technical side. This is how you implement the screen that pops up and asks you for your ID or, hey, okay, you don't want to accept fraudulent IDs, but you don't care if a document's expired or not. You just want to know if it's real. They can help customize the technology to behave however they want it. So we help bring in new business, and then we also maintain and grow 
the existing client base um, for these really large companies. Did I explain it well? Very well, very well. <laughs> I'm so glad you did. Okay. My one final question is now when someone asks you, you know, I remember you have this grandson, Abe, what does his company do? How would you explain it to them? Let's see. The company company provides security for other companies so that they don't become victims of any kind of fraud. A little caution. Yeah. You don't become victims of any kinds of fraud or documents. You would say that we, we help companies validate the identities of their end users. Yes, they do. They so maybe help. you can paraphrase that. You said it so well. I'll just use AI to put it in your voice. <laughs> okay. Well, thank you very much thank for letting me record the conversation. It's extremely rewarding. Good, and I'm glad. So Very informative. Good. And if I had a company, I would definitely employ <laughs> Verif. This podcast is brought to you by Verif. Identity verification made simple. Learn more at verif.com. <laughs>